Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our uh, water webinar series on integrating affordability into capital and financial planning. My name is Ryan Merdall, and I'm the marketing director for our water team in North America. I will be your moderator. Uh, before we get started, just a little housekeeping. You'll be muted during the presentation, but you can ask questions or put in comments at any time using the GoToWebinar questions uh, panel. We will get to those with about 15 minutes left uh, or so, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, and ask, answer your questions there. Um, I'll also open up the mics with maybe five minutes left to let you comment live or follow up on a question if you'd like to do so. Um, about a week or two after the uh, event, I will send you a certificate of attendance that you can submit for um, potential PDH credit. Uh, obviously depends on your certified agency there, but I will get you uh, the certificate. And uh, we'll also put in some additional messages in the chat about our upcoming webinars and information about the presenters and all that kind of stuff as well. And then finally, this will be recorded and posted to stantech.com. We'll give you a link to where we put all of our webinars if you'd like to share it with a colleague or a friend or refer back to it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy Burnham, who's going to kick off the presentation. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate the introduction and appreciate all of our attendees today. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think we have a, a very timely talk, topic to discuss. Um, today for the discussion um, it will be myself, um, Andy Burnham. I'm out of Tampa, Florida, and I lead our management consulting practice here at Stantec. And uh, Ben Stewart, who's actually going to take us through a demonstration of some, some digital tools around today's discussion of integrated capital and financial planning that is inclusive of um, all important affordability considerations. So before I turn it over to Ben to kind of go through uh, some key elements and attributes of, of integrated solutions, <clears throat> you know, I wanted to just give everyone a little bit of background about management consulting at Stantec. Um, <clears throat> you know, Ben and I and a team of about 35 uh, a group of individuals focus on management consulting initiatives in the areas of, of planning and financial forecasting and affordability in particular. So we work with a, a wide range of communities um, throughout North America, um, about 375 and counting at this point. Uh, we work with uh, some folks in Canada as well as uh, a significant number of folks in the United States. And <clears throat> it's been a, a pretty interesting conversation with all the communities relative to what they're dealing with from funding of their infrastructure, uh, doing financial forecasting and setting of utility rates, and how they're grappling with trying to bring affordability into that process. Um, and it's been pretty fascinating to see that a lot of uh, communities and utility providers um, don't necessarily have a complete handle on how to integrate capital planning with financial planning and affordability. And it's resulting in some uh, outcomes that you know are not necessarily holistic in nature and communities making decisions without a complete understanding of how they affect all three of those particular components and it's becoming apparent that there's a real opportunity for digital solutions to bring together these three important considerations um, to really enhance decision making but also result in a significant amount of um, efficiencies, but also transparency with internal and external stakeholders about the way that um, utilities are making decisions uh, to achieve a, a balanced and sustainable future. And so many communities have, you know, developed capital plans that are forward-looking, five-year capital improvement programs, sometimes longer, annual operating budgets, and then, you know, financial management plans that really support the funding of those two things. And you know, we see a lot of communities that have, you know, different tools to evaluate the business case decisions of, you know, investing in um, capital infrastructure, whether it's for asset management or maybe perhaps innovation and in technologies or new technologies that maybe while they increase the capital plan, it would have the hopeful effect of perhaps lowering the operating plan or operating expenses. And that can be fed into their financial plan and they're able to evaluate the great consequences of those types of decisions or business cases, if you will. And that capital component really tends to drive a lot of the discussion. And that's not surprising. Um, for many communities, spending on infrastructure is really the, the focal point of their financial management planning process. Um, operations tends to be, generally speaking, stable. 
by comparison to capital, which is seeing significant increases <clears throat> as communities grapple with aging infrastructure. And as we now enter into period of, um, at least in the immediate term of uh, inflation risk on materials and construction costs uh, going up at a pretty significant pace. And so there's a significant amount of, of volatility there that the capital improvement component of this planning process is really the focal point and um, is often uh, subject to change. And whether that's because of level of service decisions or asset management decisions, or in some cases, uh, they're in response to changes in the regulatory environment, whether it's at the federal level or at the state or provincial level, um, you know, oftentimes these regulatory requirements um, have impacts to the capital plan in order to meet them. You know, in, in my backyard in Florida, you know, we're looking at a potential bill that will come into law that would eliminate surface water discharges from wastewater plants, which would obviously affect uh, a lot of uh, capital improvement requirements that would be necessary to achieve that. And that's just one example of, of kind of a continuous stream of impact that happens to capital planning is to evaluate the cost of compliance with those types of regulatory requirements and over what time period can we achieve that compliance. And that's in addition to aging infrastructure and inflation. But for the first time, at least in the, the US, you know, we're talking about a, a federal infrastructure program for the first time in decades that may provide some funding sources to offset part of um, our capital improvement requirements. Uh, however, that may not be enough by and of itself to really, you know, soften the financial impact of capital spending decisions. And there's a lot of uncertainty around exactly how these funds will be rolled out, which projects will qualify in the time frame in which we'll, we'll be able to receive these funds for some of our infrastructure needs. And so, you know, we're in a situation where we are almost constantly having to try to keep in balance our capital needs and our financial plans to make sure that we're hitting our fund balance targets, hitting our commitments to bondholders in terms of levels of income ratios um, to necessary to uh, meet our um, bond indenture requirements or covenants. <clears throat> and yet we need to do this really in a way that we also understand the affordability impacts of these decisions um, at a community and household level. You know, some of this uh, would be familiar to those that have had to go through a consent order, consent decree, and develop a, an implementation schedule, you know, where they evaluate their financial capability to um, really absorb those compliance costs in a certain schedule. So we've got to be able to look at affordability at both a community and a household level when we're making capital decisions and understanding the financial or rate implications of those decisions. But we also need to not only do that now, um, not just at a snapshot in time, but be able to play that forward so that as we evaluate alternative scenarios of capital spending, funding sources, of inflation risk, of different rate scenarios, that we're able to understand how affordability can change over time in a particular given scenario. And this is the third piece to that planning puzzle that really needs to be integrated when we do capital planning and financial planning to really understand you know, the uh, immediate affordability, our baseline, if you will, and how that changes over time. <clears throat> and so it, it, it's effectively, I think, an approach that really will remove a blind spot for many utilities and a potential um, impediment to needed rate increases. If we have an understanding of what our current affordability is today and our current you know, demographics and socioeconomic information about our customer base, as we sit here today, we would then be able to understand how that would be influenced over time if we factor the, that information into our planning process for capital and, and rates and financial performance so that we could see for a given scenario how that changes over time, what are really the drivers of affordability for our community with that information. Is it water use? Is it incomes? Is it the trajectory on our rates? <clears throat> What's really causing um, those drivers, could it be the cost of other essential services? And with all that uh, information and understanding, we'd actually be able to set affordability metrics and key performance indicators that could be tied into those planning tools that would allow us to make decisions with affordability in mind and leverage a lot of the insights to uh, specifically target um, efficiency programs or water audits for conservation to maybe help those um, adjust their water use. That could be one element of uh, how you could approach um, high burden water bills. 
but also to design assistance programs, look at different levels of qualification <clears throat> and what the impact is not only to customers, but also to revenues with different types of discount programs as we've depicted here as an example with different levels of participation. So you'd be able to factor in the net financial impacts of providing that assistance and see how it would impact bills and make them more affordable for a given scenario. And all this really leads us to develop you know, more realistic capital plans that consider not just our financial requirements, but their affordability implications as part of the process. And so all of this is, is a lot to do. Um, <clears throat> and I think, as I mentioned at the onset, it really drives um, us as an industry to think about new ways of doing things. And we really need to find ways to have a holistic platform that integrates kind of these three planning elements in inclusive of affordability so that as we're evaluating changes in our circumstances, changes in our economic conditions, our funding sources, you know, our cost structures, that we can have a real time understanding of those impacts and our decisions that we have in response to those changing conditions so that we can make more informed decisions and know specifically how to communicate that to our customer base and also how to be able to mitigate potential high water bill burdens um, to customers you know before they become a problem and so with that what i'd like to do is uh, turn things over to ben to kind of go through an example of a tool that integrates capital financial planning and affordability um, to give everyone some insights on how this could work and really be useful in addressing um, an ever-changing environment that um, many of many of you, our clients and utilities have to work in. Thanks, so Andy. Take it away. Cool. Thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah. So to address a lot of these points that Andy was just discussing, we wanted to demonstrate this uh, our cloud-based financial model, FAMS which integrates financial planning with WARI, our detailed affordability analysis. So to do this, I wanted to start out with this baseline scenario that we're looking at here. As with any financial model, we're starting out with our beginning balances, our revenue and expense budgets, our capital plans, and our outstanding debt to create a forecast of our financial dynamics over the next 10 years. We've also included things like our financial policies, like reserve targets and financial KPIs to track our performance under these uh, forecasts. So we're starting out with a baseline scenario here of about $2 billion in CIP over the next 10 years. We're maintaining an operating reserve of six months of O&M, as you can see on our operating fund chart here, as well as a, a management target for debt service coverage of no less than 2.0 for a debt service coverage ratio. So as you can see, we're able to meet this plan of $2 billion worth of investment with a modest 3% rate increase over the next 10 years. Additionally, uh, as Andy was talking about, we can understand the affordability of this current modest plan of 3% uh, rate increases. And so to do this, we have our affordability tab within the model here. And, um, you know, Similar to a lot of financial models, we can track these affordability KPIs at the top line with simple KPIs like our bill as a percent of median household income or lowest quintile income. But we've also included our WARI, which is the weighted average residential index. And this is essentially just a, uh, a weighted average bill as a percent of income, but accounting for the full income distribution of um, not only the service area, but every census tract within the service area. And so what this table is showing is that WARI value rolled up for the entire service area. And we're also keeping track of this metric hours at minimum wage, which is the hours of work per month or yeah, hours of work per month required to pay a monthly water and sewer bill at a minimum wage. And so we've set uh, management targets of 4.5% for each of our first three metrics here, similar to uh, what the EPA commonly cites as a, as a, um, Threshold of burden is also right in the ballpark of a lot of international metrics, uh, like three to five percent used by the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. So anyway, we've set some affordability targets for each of these metrics, and we can track our performance at the top line. But to get a better understanding, we can also show these affordability dynamics throughout the service area 
to take those numbers and 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 uh, understand them within the pockets of our service area and understand that where customers facing the greatest burden um, are located. So within this map, we can zoom into specific regions, focusing on the eastern region of our service area here, and and really understand where these folks are located and and you know where the change is happening, where folks are transitioning from say a low burden to a medium burden to a high burden. So these are some uh, some of the ways we use these new tools to get a better understanding of the financial dynamics and the affordability dynamics of a given scenario. So this is all good and well with a 3% rate increase. We can see that our, our map has changed, our metrics are changing, but they're not, it's not a drastic change. So to get back to some of the points Andy was talking about, we can also run some additional alternative scenarios. So we have this nice baseline plan of 3% rate increases, but we've just found out that uh, due to some regulatory changes, we're going to be facing a much greater uh, need for investment. Um, we're gonna be, say, embarking on a, a CSO program or, or a lead line replacement program. And so to forecast and, and plan for that kind of a change, we can update our CIP, our capital improvement program, and we can do this by simply adding a new project, we'll call it a regulatory program, and we'll set that to be uh, $250 million per year. Missing a zero there with a $500 million spike in the second year because we need to make up for lost ground. So we'll carry that $250 million a year CIP uh, out over the forecast to 2031. And then we'll also set up our fund, some funding rules. So within, our, within the FAMS model here, we can also uh, be fairly specific in terms of how we wanna pay for any given project. And so you can see at the top of our columns here, we have a number of different funds that we could use to pay for these projects. Now, given this is a regulatory program, we're not gonna use any impact fees or capacity fees, but we will say we'll use some available cash as available. And once we've set these rules, we can set our initial funding option, which is our to optimize our funding. And what this means is that we're going to allow the model to use the available cash based on the rules we've just specified off to the right here. And if and when we run out of available cash in those funds, what is our fallback funding source? And so for this scenario, for, this, for these regulatory projects, we're gonna fall back to senior lien debt or say a revenue bond. So once we've set up this new scenario, we can come back to our panel and recalculate this model. Now, I don't think anybody's gonna be surprised to see that at 3% rate increases, this isn't gonna cut it. So we've just added you know, over uh, $2.5 billion worth of capital. 3% rate increases are gonna be um, woefully insufficient. And, but we don't really know where we're starting on these rate increases. So we'll come back to some of our inputs here and here's where we can drive um, not only our rate increases using our overrides, but a number of different uh, forecast assumptions and forecast drivers. For example, that operating reserve we talked about earlier, we could change that here. We can also change things like our O&M and CIP execution as appropriate. But to start with, we're just gonna clear out our rate increases because we don't really know where we're starting now that we've added all of this capital. And so once we clear out those rate increases, what the model will do is solve for just-in-time rate increases. So it's gonna use the available funds um, first, and, and then once funds run out, it will apply those funding rules that we talked about earlier for the capital projects, and then as needed, raise rates to meet our financial targets year over year. So with this scenario, you can see that we don't necessarily need a, need a rate increase in that first year, but once that massive capital uh, program hits, we're looking at some a couple of years worth of double digit rate increases. And so I don't think anybody on this call is looking forward to going out to their rate payers and talking about 20 and 12% rate increases. So instead we can come back to our inputs here 
and we can look at a way to levelize these rate increases. Now, to just save some time, I've saved these uh, these inputs, so we can save a series of inputs within our model here, and I've saved the rate increase program that's needed to meet this funding need. And so you can see I've also saved that CIP, the regulatory CIP that we were just talking about. Oh, I forgot a $50 million ramp up. Um, as well as our, our uh, the rate plan needed to solve that particular CIP program. And so if we recalculate this model now, we'll get a more smoothed out uh, set of rate increases that should meet these financial objectives and this um, additional regulatory program. So it's still a bit of a shock, but we're not, you know, holding off for three years and then facing a 20% rate increase. We're now starting earlier and have a series of 9% rate increases before we gradually ratchet down to 5% rate increases in the last four years. And we're just maintaining those financial targets that we were talking about earlier. So now that we have this uh, large change in our financial plan, it'd be useful to be able to go back and compare this scenario to our baseline in terms of the affordability and how this looks throughout our service area. So I've gone ahead and saved this scenario that we were just talking about as a scenario within our plan. We also have that baseline that we were starting with. Now we've still got the same 2021 map here, looking at that WARI, the Weighted Average Residential Index. But now, I. If you'll recall, we did not see quite this much red in that previous iteration. So we can clearly see that a lot has changed. And if we want a clearer picture, we can compare these scenarios side by side. And so active here is that regulatory program that we just looked at. And we can refer back to our baseline scenario and just see exactly where those, air, those uh, uh, affordability dynamics have changed. So you can see a lot of that red has extended out from the eastern portion and more and more of our service areas facing that high burden threshold. So we're not done yet. We don't think that this is a, a viable plan. Um, and as Andy mentioned earlier, there is a lot of talk and a lot of uh, momentum behind some federal infrastructure programs uh, that are looking to help support communities with low interest loans and some grant programs to help make investments in their in their um, in their infrastructure more tenable, and so I've also set up a, 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 a yet another scenario here. And if I come back to our CIP to save us all some time, I'll just refer to this saved CIP. And what I'm doing is cre um, completing the exact same amount of investment, but I've created a separate line here for just the loan funded portion. And we're going to look at a scenario where we are we received $450 million in, in some federal assistance um, in the form of a low interest loan. And we've simply just deducted that from the total we were looking at earlier. Additionally, we'll look at the, uh, we'll also bring in some grants from that same federal assistance program and look at $50 million worth of grants over two years in 23 and 24 to help alleviate some of this uh, burden. And so now that we've brought this grant funding into our uh, uh, capital funding mix, if I go back to my CIP here, and we talked about these funding rules earlier, you can see we've now set up uh, an allocation or, or a rule to apply that grant funding specifically to those regulatory projects. So all $50 million of, of federal grants will go towards that regulatory program. And for our loan program, we've just set the override, so we don't need to work through all the logic. We're just going to push that straight to a loan. Now, one thing I haven't done yet is to actually set up that low interest loan. And so we have all of our financing assumptions here. And so if I use yet another one of my saved inputs, I can set up this low interest loan program of a half percent interest rate. It's a pretty good deal with 30 year loans for those three, um, for that $450 million loan we're getting from the federal government. And so now with all of these changes, we can come back to our plan and let's recalculate that using the rate increases we had set before. And we're well above our margin, right? We're well above our targets. Our debt service coverage is well above 2.0 
and we even have a little bit of surplus cash in 2025. So to meet this particular plan's funding needs, we can bring these rate increases down to a series of seven and 6% rate increases. And if we recalculate this model now, we'll see that that, set of, that, that rate plan will again meet those financial targets just, just uh, above our 2.0 debt service coverage by the final years and maintaining that operating reserve. Now, before we go back to our affordability maps, let's take a look at one other uh, scenario around this, this regulatory program. So we, we, we like the fact that we've brought down our rate increases. We don't see those 9% in the first three years anymore, uh, but we think there's more we can do. And so we've hired some of Stantec's finest engineers, and we're gonna look at some alternative capital programs and some alternative ways to address these regulatory needs um, but in a more uh, prudent manner to, to help alleviate some of these burdens that we're seeing in our service area. And so what we can do is set up yet another CIP scenario here where we're going to take that initial spike and we're going to take 200, uh, $200 million off of that. So, you know, we took this, this um, optimized portion, the non-loan funded portion of $350 million down to $150 and then we're gonna spread that out over the subsequent years. So we've added another $20 million into the following years. So we're just taking that spike and we're gonna help, you know, we're gonna to try to spread that, that uh, need out over the next 10 years and, and you know, utilizing some new technologies and, and some uh, more current approaches to help meet the same requirements uh, of that regulatory program. So we've redistributed our capital load and additionally, We've invested in some new operating technologies that will uh, help us bring down our O&M budget. And so we've also set up an optimized O&M program where we can bring, we're going to reduce our O&M by $15 million a year starting in 2025 after the system optimization and automation program is completed. So now we're really starting to combine, you know, we started with this massive regulatory program that's going to, you know, have nine and eight percent rate increases we've leveraged a lot of different funding mechanisms including federal assistance and low interest loans and some grant programs and now we've brought in the technical aspect by you know uh, bringing in our, our technical experts and, and, and engineers to improve our operations and improve that capital plan so now that we've come at this from all sides We'll look at yet another set of rate increases to help meet this particular plan. And now we're coming down closer to 6.3% for this new uh, regulatory program. So again, with this 6.3% rate increase, we're just hitting those financial targets throughout uh, the 10-year the forecast period. We're hitting that operating fund. We can see that our operating fund is actually, uh, operating fund target is actually decreased with that reduction in our O&M budget. And you can see that we are tracking all of our different financial metrics. We can evaluate how we're paying for that capital. Got our senior lien debt, our cash funded component. And now that we've really maximized all of these um, uh, opportunities to reduce the burden on our ratepayers, we can come back to our affordability analysis here. And before we get into looking at all of the, the impacts throughout the service area, we can start by just looking at these top line metrics. So we started with our baseline scenario. We then went to a massive you know, in, uh, increase in investment without a lot of fine tuning. And we also then did everything we could from a financial and technical perspective to try to bring down this, this, uh, the affordability or the, the financial burden uh, to our ratepayers. And so now, well, I don't need that one. That's our active scenario. So now you can see each of these scenarios side by side in our affordability KPIs. So just looking at this bill as percent of median household income, we start with our baseline B, and you can see we're staying below that target of 4.5% all the way through 2031 with those 3% rate increases. But that wasn't viable once we got um, once we started to address this regulatory need, 
And under those initial plans, we had to take the take our rate increases up to nine, eight, and seven percent. And that led us to uh, a bill as a percent of median household income of 5.7% by that final year. And through a lot of hard work from our financial planners and our engineers, you know, it's not a, a massive improvement, but we were able to bring that down um, uh, by, by leveraging all of these financial and, and engineering tools down to 5.4%. So we understand that we're still exceeding those targets but we're gonna at least get through the next five to, to seven years before we get above that 4.5%. Maybe we can reevaluate some things in our final five years and we're making improvements over the, where we started on this regulatory program. Additionally, we can come back to our side-by-side -side map comparison and we can bring back that first regulatory program. We can really understand where these changes have been felt most, most significantly. So you can see we've mitigated some of these high burden red areas. Um, fewer of our customers are facing those, those high burdens of, of bills over four and a half percent. And we can key in on some of these areas in the Eastern portion to really see you know, where we've uh, achieved the, the, the greatest benefits. But in looking at this map, you can see that we're still, you know, we only brought our, our metrics down by 0.3%. We've still got a lot of areas that are facing a high burden. And so it'd be useful to have a better understanding of our customers and of our residents. So we've also set up a, a pair of uh, community and customers maps. So these maps are here to just give us some background and a better understanding of our residents. And so we can map all sorts of different socioeconomic indicators. You know, we start out with our poverty rate here where the darker shades are higher rates of poverty. Unsurprisingly, we see the greatest concentration in the Eastern portion of our service area. Similarly, we have the lowest median household income in that area, represented by the, the light shading of the blue um, over here in, the, in that low income portion of our service area. But you know, we can get a lot more information beyond just these maps when we click into any of these, in, into any of these census tracts. And so I've set up uh, a whole slew of, of metrics that might be of interest for each census tract as we think about our customers. So we've got a lot of that information that we had mapped with our median household income, lowest quintile income. We can also track things like our consumption. So here we have our, our typical monthly consumption in 100 cubic feet, what the, typical, uh, what the typical bill is, what that assistance program bill might look like, as well as a number of these socioeconomic indicators. Now, one other thing we can track is the uh, participation rate of our assistance program by census tract. So we've included our current assistance program participants, um, as well as our total residential customer um, households and that uh, current customer assistance program participation. And so we're, we're about 14% of residents in this census tract are participating in our assistance program. So from a high level financial planning and uh, capital planning perspective, we feel like we've really done everything we can here. But as a final step, we want to look at the possibility, the viability of increasing enrollment in our customer assistance program. So as a final step here, I'll come back to our inputs and we've included an assistance program participation adjustment. So as we go out and start communicating this plan to our customers, we also want to uh, be sure that we understand the challenges that they're facing. And we're gonna set an, a, a management goal of trying to increase our participation in these programs by 5% a year. Now it's too late to do anything this year and, and we're not really ramped up to do that next year, but starting in 2023, we're gonna to try to increase our participation by 5% per year. So to start with, we're gonna to wanna to understand what our financial impacts would be of that kind of a change. So we've included that, uh, into our forecast, we'll recalculate our model. And we can see that we just had a very minimal change in our debt service coverage in those final years. So it did have an impact, but we're still able to, to, to meet all of our objectives with this 6.3% rate plan, while also increasing our participation in our program by 5% a year. If we come back to our affordability here, now, it's not a big enough change to, um, 
see it in the maps, right, with that modest increase in, in assistance programs. But we can see it if we compare our scenarios with the top line here. Now, our first couple of metrics don't change because we're just using one typical bill, and that's one shortcoming of these metrics. But when we look at our worry analysis, and I failed to mention earlier, this worry analysis, not only does it include the income distribution of every census tract, but it also includes the typical bill of every census tract. So we've just changed what the typical bill is for each census tract by weighting it to, you know, more towards those assistance programs. And so again, it's a modest uh, uh, benefit, but we have, we are, we are making steps, we're making strides towards increasing those affordability outcomes by, you know, increasing participation in our customer assistance program or, or say our conservation program. One final item to help understand the affordability landscape. A lot of times these regulatory programs come with um, some requirements or some guidance in terms of uh, financial capability assessments. The APA um, uh, includes a, a financial capability assessment as part of its CSO programs. And so we've also included that within our financial model here. And now this is a very specific example for those CSO financial capability assessments. And for that particular application, we've set up a series of worksheets and tables to populate where you work through the required calculations of, you know, what's the cost per household, what's your residential indicator, which is that bill as a percent of income, as well as a number of different financial and socioeconomic metrics. And we can track how our track our score uh, within that financial capability assessment framework. But in other applications, this could simply be replaced by, say, a bond ratings worksheet, if that's something of interest. So, you know, we can include some of these um, high-level uh, uh, summary calculations um, based on financial metrics or affordability metrics to get a better understanding of a given plan's impact to uh, affordability or rating scores. And so with that, I can go ahead and pass the mic back, and I think the next step is a Q&A. Is that correct? It is. Thanks, Benny. I'd like to turn things over to Ryan to make sure that we um, allow time for our participants to um, ask us any questions um, and, and get some answers to those um, during our, our time allotment today. Yeah, of course, Andy. I made you the presenter again there. Yep. We do have uh, some questions that have come in, so um, I will go ahead and start asking those. And again, feel free to put your questions in the questions box, comments, and we'll get to as many as we can in the time we have remaining. So first up, uh, kind of a general question here, but a good one. Um, in what ways are you seeing public utilities address affordability in their current financial planning or pricing practices? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Ryan. That's a good question. There's several different ways that communities um, we've seen address affordability um, using financial planning strategies in tandem with rate structure strategies. Um, you know, one is a lot of utilities have concerns about fixed cost recovery and revenue stability, and there's been a trend in the industry to start increasing fixed monthly service charges or even establishing those for utilities that hadn't previously had them. But for lower volume users, you know, those um, could represent substantial impacts to their bill or represent a significant part of their bill. So by increasing those, um, you know, many times there's a correlation between lower usage customers um, and incomes. And so that's from an affordability perspective, something that folks have been looking at other solutions to address that fiscal stability um, objective. Um, by doing things such as looking at their reserve policies and making sure that they have a rate stabilization reserve or higher level of operating reserve um, to mitigate some of that potential risk of uh, revenue changes uh, because of uh, usage changes. <clears throat> or also looking at things like tiered uh, rate structures instead of uniform rates, where instead of having a single volumetric rate, um, they'll look to have an inclining block rate structure um, where the price, um, you know, escalates for higher use that's um, likely discretionary and likely also associated with non-indoor purposes 
that also contributes to a lot of the peak demands on the system. So there's kind of a nice cost nexus there that we've seen communities look to that you know addresses equity and proportionality from a cost distribution standpoint but also provides not only an incentive for conservation but shelters lower volume uses from absorbing some of those costs that they otherwise would in a uniform rate so those are kind of a, a couple of key strategies that we see out there now that are you know in the context of traditional um, you know rate making structures and financial planning policies that communities have tried to use in addition to you know things like ben mentioned in terms of you know discount programs you know, in, in crisis assistance, um, you know, programs. Yeah, good. So uh, a good lead into another question that's come in. Basically, um, federal funding is sometimes limited or harder to access. What are some alternative funding sources that communities have used that you're aware of? Yeah, uh, that's interesting. We've, we've seen some communities uh, that have had just general challenges in terms of timing of the magnitude of investment required look to some alternative solutions such as local option sales taxes or to try to maximize cost recovery of you know capital by doing maybe special assessments for localized infrastructure or making sure that they're enhancing their capacity fees or system development or impact fees for growth related infrastructure um, those have been a, a couple that we've seen come up in addition to looking at um, you know, separate kind of vehicles for cost recovery. Um, they're not new in, in Wisconsin in terms of having, you know, separate charges um, that, you know, could actually show up as, as part of um, the property tax bill for fire protection or special surcharges that could account for specific cost requirements. So I think, you know, getting outside of traditional fixed and variable charges, you know, there's some options that communities are looking at, you know, when they're in a situation where they don't feel like they have enough tools in those conventional toolboxes to be able to address the, the magnitude of um, spending that they're seeing or affordability concerns that they're seeing in their legal environment. Okay, thanks. Uh, a really interesting question here from Loretta. Can intergenerational equity be addressed in the analysis so that those who benefit pay for that benefit? That's that's also another really good question. Um, a lot of communities and utilities will have uh, some, um, whether they're informal or formal, um, capital funding policies and debt policies that really look to establish that type of a, a relationship between the capital projects and how they're funded. So similar to how Ben was showing kind of different funding rules for certain projects in the model, uh, we see a lot of communities give thought to making sure that for kind of continuous, you know, renewal and replacement expenditures that need to happen year over year, you know, rates need to be sufficient to cover that. Um, otherwise, it's it's kind of, you know, a situation where if you continue to borrow for those recurring needs, you'll be paying more in principal and interest um, than you would if you had just, you know, sized your, your revenue stream to cover those uh, recurring annual cash expenditures. But for new assets, you know, new treatment plans or, assets that you know are complete rehabilitations and that reset the useful life of assets you know that's where i think the use of longer term financing mechanisms and you know setting that up for those types of projects makes a lot of sense to preserve that intergenerational equity dynamic because future ratepayers will benefit from those types of investments that really reset you know the useful life of an asset or create new assets that are sized to meet you know growth over the next 10 20 or 30 years so Great comment and question, and it really should be considered in the context of project-specific funding, but also potentially in you know formal or informal um, you know debt uh, policies. Okay. Um, how would the model deal with the utility wanting to look at a P3 as an option to potentially reduce rates and guarantee service cost and rates on a, a long-term basis? So bringing in some private funding. Sure. I, you know, I think similar to what Ben had set up for the discussion purposes today on the federal funding programs, you know, it's really a matter of defining, you know, the elements of the P3 relationship in terms of what would be the impacts to operating costs, um, both positive and negative potential revenue streams, capital cost, um, and, you know, if there's any lease components or, um, you know, return requirements of, you know, the private entity you know, those would be factored in and, and could be adjusted in the model and then compare it against a, a more conventional scenario of, you know, delivering an asset and continuing under 
kind of the traditional business model and operations, if you will. So really for kind of any, any scenario that we want to look at, it's really having the information identified so that you can change the assumptions to model that scenario. And then, you know, within FAMS, as Ben showed, we can save some of those uh, inputs as cases and then build them as scenarios. So you could compare the results of the P3 based upon the assumptions or parameters of it, you know, as compared to, you know, different alternatives that you may have, you know, for uh, going forward. So very, very programmable, if you will, the platforms highly customizable as has been mentioned to be able to, to run those types of scenarios. All right, so you mentioned the customization. There's a question here about uh, how would you get uh, the community's data into and update it within FAMS? Sure, uh, Ben, uh, why don't you go ahead and take that one? Sure, yeah, there's a, there are a number of different ways to get the information into the model. Um, one is simply, you know uh, what we had shown today where we create these editable tables like we showed with the cip today so you could simply plug in new information and that information can expand you know with new projects um, new transfers new uh, outstanding debt obligations um, and even new expense budgets but we've also set up uh, especially for cases where you might have a very large table say a, a hundred or a thousand row um, operating budget we've set up the ability to upload an Excel file into the model. So as long as that, you know, that file, that flat sheet stays in a consistent format, we can accommodate it. And as you, you know, get a new mid-year budget or something like that, you can simply upload a new budget. And the nice thing about that is when you use that uh, functionality, you don't lose the original budget. The original budget can stay there as a baseline um, but you can then, almost like the scenarios we were looking at today with the different saved inputs, you can refer to either budget and pick and choose, you know, if you have five different budgets that you're thinking about, um, you can pick and choose between those budgets and, and look at the financial impacts of those. So there, there are a few different ways, but those are kind of the, the main inputs for, for larger uh, data files and, and data sources. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, um, more on the output side of things, uh, customers may request the basis for some of the algorithms embedded in the FAMS model uh, to prove that the assumptions are reasonable and reflect, reflect uh, real world circumstances. Can you discuss how this information would be provided or might be provided? Well, in terms of the output schedules, you know, there's a few different options, um, you know, from an algorithm standpoint, you know, on the back end, what we do is customize, you know, detailed outputs from FAMS that can provide everything from beginning balances, you know, assumptions and historical data for um, accounts and build volumes, um, inflation factors for operating expenses, capital, interest rate assumptions, um, revenue calculations, and same, same for operating expenses. And we typically produce those kind of as similar to the inputs as Ben mentioned as flat files. So in Excel, that that way they can be, you know, customized so that they could be readily incorporated into um, client systems or, you know, otherwise manipulated and adjusted, um, you know, by communities as part of their, you know, evaluation process so that they can, you know, test out and, and work with the numbers to, you know, compare and, and validate those. Um, additionally, you know, if there's elements of it that, you know, just in the interface itself, you know, we really didn't focus on it, but you could really grab any of the images in the interface and just copy it into a PowerPoint presentation um, or into a Word document or even into Excel um, and to be able to work with the values that you see um, from any of the particular um, tabs of the interface. So a lot of different options to get the information out. And I think those detailed schedules at the back end are probably the ones that would be really the most in-depth detail so that you can basically see all the, the pieces um, to um, the given scenario that you're working with, um, you know, within the model. Okay, hey, great. Uh, some more questions here. Um, how customizable is the platform for standalone utilities, like a water-only agency, and can it incorporate stormwater costs? So, Ben, I'll, I'll let you um, take that one because I know you've sure. got some pretty specific experience doing just that in California with, with Needles and San Diego and a few other agencies. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say the most most common application is a single standalone utility that you know, we do get into a number of cases with, like the example we showed today of uh, sewer and water. Um, but you know, more often than not, it is a standalone utility. So we can customize it to either you know one, two, three different components to a utility. Um, and then in terms of the type of utility and what types of costs come into play, um, you know, we've set these up for water, wastewater, reclaimed water, general funds, stormwater utilities, electric utilities, streets, special revenue funds. So basically, you know, any um, any fund, uh, any utility, uh, we've probably done something exactly like it or similar. Um, so it's just a matter of, uh, as Andy was talking about earlier, customizing it to match the dynamics of that given utility and you know how it's how it uses reserves, what its policies are, what its funding sources are. Um, so you know, in some cases, uh, like one we're working with in California here, we're looking at creating a brand new uh, stormwater utility or something close to it. And so that is a lot of scenario analysis, looking at all sorts of different potential fun funding mechanisms. And so we've customized the tool to match that and have that capability to look at pulling funds from you know, a fee or some other outside sources or some cost recovery mechanisms or some general fund contributions. So it, it's very, very highly customizable to match the, um, the situation at hand. All right, great, thank you. Um, can you get, let's see, can you get into a bit more depth on exactly what worry is and how the income thresholds used can be set? Yeah, I can get uh, this one started, and Andy, feel free to chime in. But um, the the worry analysis is designed to be a, a, a geographical analysis initially, and so, like I had mentioned earlier, um, it's based on income distribution and typical bills uh, for each individual census tract. So it starts with a detailed analysis of billing data, uh, geolocating that, and um, polling income information you know, here in the US from the Census Bureau. And so we, we overlay those two pieces of information to essentially calculate that bill as a percent of income for the entire income distribution. And then the weighted average part is weighting that bill burden uh, by the number of households within that, that income bin. So it's a, it's a fairly big complex model, but it ultimately gets at you know, what is our average bill as a percent of income. And then when we think about the threshold side of it, so what are we comparing this number to? I'm so used to seeing bill as a percent of median household income. Um, there's a lot of flexibility and it's really up to you know, what, how you wanna think about it, how you wanna gauge it, just like with a lot of these uh, key performance indicators. So as an example, um, you know, when we do a financial capability assessment, we try to calibrate that high burden threshold back to say a 2% of median household income for a sewer bill or four and a half for for a water and wastewater bill combined. But in other cases where we're not working with a financial capability assessment and we have a bit more flexibility, um, you know, we've set metrics that kind of correspond to different checkpoints. So say the low burden would for a combined bill would be 2%, um, which is uh, I think some rating agencies say, you know, that's a, a strong um, rating or a strong score uh, if your combined bill is less than 2% of, of income. Um, and then say the midpoint would be something like eight hours at minimum wage, which I think comes to something like four and some change percent. And then as an upper threshold, um, we could set something like uh, 6%, which would maybe be based on your specific rate structure and saying this is um, our low income or our efficient bill relative to our lowest quintile income. So basically we don't want our service area uh, to, to be uh, uh, have a higher worry value than an efficient bill at a low income threshold. So you can make, you can kind of tailor these thresholds to match um, what your what kind of information you're trying to get out of the analysis. Okay, good. All right, we've got five minutes left here, so I'm going to turn uh, the mute function off. So. If anybody would like to ask a question or follow up or comment live, you're welcome to do so now. You should be able to unmute yourself.
And if not, that's okay as well. Obviously, you can see the contact information for Andy and Ben on the screen. You're welcome to follow up with them uh, directly uh, through email there to ask any further questions. All right, well, if that's it, I think we'll give everybody back about four minutes in their day. Uh, I just want to say thanks again for joining. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, you'll note in the chat links to our upcoming webinars as well as recordings of past webinars. And we look forward to seeing you uh, on one in the future. Thanks to Andy and Ben for the great presentation. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, folks. Have a nice day, everyone.